on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hiker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Zach Alley is officially the new defensive coordinator at OU, and Casey Thompson is coming from the portal. Plus, Nick Saban retired. Kalen DeBoer taken over at Bama. And we talk a lot of NFL playoffs and winners and losers of the weekend. Please download and subscribe to the podcast. Rate it five stars and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right, our man Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Sunday, January 14th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful, award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match, Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of January, all you got to do is visit Riverwind.com. Riverwind Casino, simply the best. Now recording this Sunday night, please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment. Ted, we have a lot of people that listen to this podcast that are Dallas Cowboys fans. So we figured, hey, let's wait till the Cowboys game is over and then we'll record so we can talk about it in winners and losers. And, you know, a lot of our listeners will want to hear about that. We didn't have to wait to the end. We'll get to that. But yeah, they... uh the Packers the game was over before the time elapsed. Yeah. Once the Packers made it 48 to 16, we went ahead and said, yeah, let's get started. Brutal, brutal. And we'll get to that. We'll, we'll get to that. Oh, you football stuff. Zach Alley officially named the co-defensive coordinator for the Oklahoma Sooners. Also the linebackers coach. That it is official. All the conspiracy theories can now subside. How are you feeling about it? I like it. I feel good about it. Um, you know, from the from the very beginning, it it's I've heard a bunch of good things. High energy, going to help a bunch in recruiting. Uh, now you look at that staff on the defensive side, and you know, offense is great too. Just defensively, every position you've got a home run hitter in recruiting. So um, he cut his teeth on Venable system, learned everything he, he knows about coaching and about building a defense and uh, how he coaches backers and all of that stuff by, you know, running a coach Venable shadow. So I, I got nothing bad to say about it. I like it. And admittedly, I don't know a whole lot about him other than what I've heard. He's 30. I know that. Yeah. So uh, you immediately think, hey, younger guy going to bring some energy each and every day into that building. It, it was funny. It finally became official. Before that, for multiple days, I had had several high school football coaches reach out to me because Zach Alley was at the Oklahoma Football Coaches Association Winter Coaches Clinic. And they all like, he's hired. He's hired. He's hired. He's definitely <laughs> hired. I don't know why it hasn't been announced. It was pretty funny. They just kept rolling in. Uh, it made me laugh. But yeah, I, I think that the general reaction is excitement from the fan base. And, and it should yeah. be. This guy's done some really nice things over the last three seasons, calling defenses. And you touched on it. There was a quote in the press release that really stood out to me from him. He said, everything I do is based on what Coach Venables did at Clemson. That's been the foundation for how I built defenses. So one of the things you get concerned about, you bring in a new coordinator, sometimes you're worried about like a learning curve. I I don't think that's going to be much of an issue for Zach Alley. And I'm sure he's got some things that he's going to want to implement, some ideas he wants to bounce off Venables but it does seem like the transition, which has already started clearly, but it does seem like the transition should be pretty smooth for him. Yeah. Now you you have to imagine that while Venables has been at Oklahoma and, and Zach Alley's been doing his thing, 
they've diverged a little bit on on what they're doing. That's natural. But with as close as this relationship is, I don't think it's been two and a half years or however long since Brent Venables had a conversation with, with Zach Alley. I'm sure they're in contact a lot about what they're seeing in the sport, what they're doing, what they're looking at implementing, different stuff that they've, they've tried. I mean, that's how those conversations usually go. So I agree. I think, I mean, the transition period is learning players' names, right? Introducing himself to recruits that they've been recruiting for uh, however long now. That That's probably about the the only, uh, you know, warming up period you're going to have from him. He should be able to hit the ground running right out of the gate. Yeah. One thing that is non, not in the press release, one sentence you're not going to find, there is no mention of Zach Alley calling the defense. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not shocked. And we'll, we'll see how that ends up working out. Do I think that Venables would like to get to a place to where he doesn't have to be as involved in the defense? I do think he wants to get there. But I just have no clue when that's going to be. It was yeah. not mentioned in the press release. I know that. Yeah, well, you know, I'm sure he's going to call it, and I'm sure Venables is going to have veto power. You know, the thing about calling defense is defense is, it can be more of a committee than maybe offense can. You know, as the offense is in the huddle or at the line and you know, you've got all your pre snap stuff going on. Like there's a conversation going on in the headset. Here's what they like. I think we should do this. No, no, no. Let's, let's play coverage here. I mean, you can have a heavy, like Allie can call the defense and Venable standing right here can have a heavy influence on what's called before it's ever signaled in. So, I mean, it wouldn't shock me if it's, to some degree by committee, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah, you know, I I I can't wait to see how it how it works out. Yeah. But one of the other things that was mentioned in the Zach Alley press release was that Jay Valai, he's added another title to his title. So now assistant head coach for defense, co-defensive coordinator, pass defense coordinator. Cornerbacks and nickelbacks coach. Got it? Love it. I just want to see the plate outside of the office. Do you think every single one is listed <laughs> on the nameplate? It should be. It better be. It should, just as a good joke, as a good laugh, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I give that man as many titles as you need to give him. That's right. I have been ever since he got to Norman, just getting to talk to him during the season, I've been incredibly impressed with the way that he goes about his business, with the way that he coaches his group, with the attitude that he instills in those guys. I think he's done a really good job, man. And I just love everything he's about. And I think he's been an extremely valuable addition. And, of course, he's a great recruiter. I mean, how many of these big-time recruits talk about how much they love the lies? So I yeah, give him every title he needs. Would it yeah. pay him more money? Keep paying him more money. I think he is. I think he's eventually going to be, you know, a high level defensive coordinator. And I would be really surprised if he's not a head coach someday. Yeah, I agree. hundred um, percent. I would say the only thing that held us back at corner this year was injury, man. We were banged up at corner, you know, pretty much nonstop. So get those guys healthy. The young recruits that are coming in, continue to be really good looking players with great size and measurables. And we we've added some veteran guys to the portal for a handful of years now. So I think he's done a great job. I'm with you. All right. Portal updates. Casey Thompson coming hmm. to Oklahoma for his seventh season of college football, got a medical hardship after tearing his ACL this season at FAU. He will be walking on. And it seems like he will be walking on with the understanding that his role is to be the veteran in the locker room, to be the veteran in that quarterback room, 
and to be the backup quarterback. And I, I played with Kendall, his brother. I, I, I know that family. I'm fired up that he's going to be part of the team. The fact that he's played at Nebraska, Texas, and Oklahoma is just insane. I don't think we'll ever see that again. It's pretty cool, honestly. But we all know how important, every OU fan knows how important QB depth is at this point after what we went through two years ago when DG went down. So I, I'm i fired up for it because I think it gets you a veteran guy that's played a lot of football that also, he's just about the right things. Man, has always carried himself well uh, when he was a starter, when he wasn't the starter. I just, I think he's a good addition to the locker room. I, I actually think it may be the most perfect situation you could come up with. Number one, he's walking on. He's not taking a scholarship spot. And those spots are difficult right now, trying to get your roster right. Whenever you're bringing in high school kids, the portal, everything is, there's a lot to juggle there. That's massive. That's number one. Number two, you got a guy that's played a bunch of big time football in, in a lot of big games, started a bunch of them and has a wealth of experience that he can bring to what is going to be a really young room. And he can compete and push Jackson Arnold without combating with him, right? With kind of knowing the role that he's stepping into for, for Hawkins and the young guys, uh, a veteran voice there, someone to, to just kind of move things forward in the right way. And he's, he's been a bunch of places with different coaches, brings a bunch of different uh, experiences there. I think it's great. And I think he could do well in a pitch. He's got yeah. really good athleticism, throws a good ball. Um, I, I think without a doubt, he can step in there and, and play quarterback for you in a pinch and get the job done. You can never have too many quarterbacks that have started a lot of games on your roster. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's just so valuable. And yeah, let me make something clear. Casey, he probably understands what's what that doesn't mean that he's not going to try to win the job. Let's make that very clear. I mean, no doubt. I, I, I wouldn't want him to come into this, uh, into this locker room. If that's not how he was thinking, that's how, you know, all these guys that are playing at this level think, but uh, I'm with you. I think he's going to push those young guys. Also just think about how much football he's played and he's seen when it comes to coverages, being able to talk through stuff, in meetings with Jackson Arnold, with Hawkins, with Zerbrug, now that they're on campus early. It, it's just an extremely valuable resource for those guys. And once again, I, I he also, he's just carried himself so well throughout college. And I just think having a guy like that around who's been very mature and from everything I could tell is taking kind of a professional approach to things. I just think that's a good example to have in that room. Not saying that any of those guys you know, aren't like that, but it's just having a veteran guy around like that is extremely valuable in my mind. And I, I was thinking about this, Ted. Venables and this staff, they've done a much better job of recruiting the state of Oklahoma. And, and I know Casey was like the class of 2018. But it's likely that Casey Thompson goes to OU if this staff was in place back then. Yeah. Was, I mean, he was, he was one of, if not the best quarterback in the state of Oklahoma that year, extremely talented. So and, and that's something I was thinking about. I was like, he probably would have been a sooner if Venables would have been the head coach. Now, whether he was a scholarship guy or a walk on, that's a different discussion, but we've seen this staff really focus on bringing in-state kids in, whether it's preferred walk-on stuff where their tuition's being covered with NIL. But I was just thinking about that. I I don't know if he ends up somewhere else, if the current recruiting philosophy, in-state recruiting philosophy would have been in place. Yeah, that's a good point. And um, 
I'm just I'm glad that we have him now. I again I think it's a perfect perfect situation for the quarterback room. Um, you got the old vet in there. I mean, he's, he's got some, he's got some years on him and you think about like a, an early arrival guy like Hawkins and a guy like, like Thompson, it's like, he's going to feel like he's going to feel ancient to Hawkins, right? Like it, it's, it's so interesting to think about that. Like, and, and the fact that they're going to be in the same room, I think is great. Bring you know that that veteran mentality to workouts in the locker room, not just what the quarterbacks are doing. Home run. And the portal window, as far as I can tell, is closed. Now we'll get to this with some coaching changes around the country. You're still going to see some of those guys. There's that 30 day window when there's a coaching change, but when you look at OU specifically and the losses via the portal, you lose Dylan Gabriel, and we all know that that is a complex situation. And that was always the expectation that the 2023 season was going to be his last season at OU. Ted, other than losing Caden Green to Missouri, you don't really lose any significant guys. Now you lose Dalen Smothers. That was an interesting one. He's headed back closer to home, uh, going to NC State. But Key Lawrence. Key Lawrence. That was an interesting situation. But I think that I, I don't think Key was going to be a starter at safety for them in 2024 with, with some of the young talent at that position. But we always talk about it. Hey, the portal giveth and the portal taketh. You made it. You made out pretty well with the uh, take a thing piece of things. Yeah. Got I and and I think Venables has to feel good, and that staff they got to feel good that what they've been preaching, kind of the culture that they have built, seems to have taken root. And let's be real, the the move to the SEC helps. It just does. Yeah, yeah. I, I think. I think it's been a, a really good cycle for him. The Caden Green situation hurts. It does. There's no way around that. Um, I it doesn't feel like they could have managed that a different way. You know, it, it sounds like he had he had made up in his mind that he was going to go pretty quickly. I I don't know. Um, maybe that's not right. But outside of that, it you got to feel like you are a winner right now in the transfer portal. It's always going to be, you know, incoming versus outgoing. And that's going to be a tough one there, but you know, we got some good pieces there on the offensive line that, that may have some upside there. Um, the big winners probably got to be the tight end room with what we've done there. And then you added some, you know, sp sprinkled in a couple of other uh, players with some experience at some other spots and a wide receiver at edge and, all in all, it looks pretty solid. Yeah, but uh, I, I think that it, it's it got to feel good for the staff to not lose. I mean, how many teams across the country lost key contributors? A lot. Guys that were the most productive guys on their team. And yeah, the Caden Green one hurts, but other than that, got to feel pretty good about things if you're that Oklahoma staff, we'll discuss, there's a lot of new faces that got there this week. We've got the entire list, but we'll discuss all those new faces, what that looks like on Wednesday's episode, or else this podcast is going to be approximately three hours long. So <laughs> let's, let's get to call your shot. We asked you guys the most important thing that happened this weekend for Oklahoma football. This first one comes from Cliff Mannon, who says, officially signing Alley so the staff is in place and we can fully go after portal needs as well as next signing day in February. Having stability will help with all the changes elsewhere. That's an interesting point because there has been a ton of change for Oklahoma when it comes to the staff, but Zach Alley being hired, it, it feels like things are calm and settled now. 
it's the strangest thing ever that you lose you lose your starting quarterback, your offensive coordinator, your defensive coordinator, and really nothing has changed. I mean, it has, but it hasn't. Like your your backup quarterback's gonna come right in running the same system and it that system is going to morph over time but it's not like a erase everything and we're installing something new and relearning everything no that's not what's going to be taking place and it's the same exact thing on defense you part ways with the defensive coordinator and you hire a new one and nothing really changes there's a new coach coaching linebackers but it's about as it's about as much change as you could go through with no like real nuts and bolts having to be moved around. And I, all of that being said, like if you were to tell someone we lost our offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator, it would feel like chaos, but it's just, you're moving right in stride. It is a strange feeling, but a good strange, I think. I think it's a good strange. All right. This second one, it's a perfect transition, which is why I've selected it. It comes from Jonathan Grant, who says, Saban retiring. Since we won our last title, Saban himself won as many titles as OU has in their entire history. Mm. When he, yeah. fra- I didn't love that he framed it like that, but when he framed it like that, I looked at it multiple times and just went, damn. He's right. How about this? Uh, I guess the better way to frame it is we haven't won a title since Saban has. So now that he's out of the way, here we go. Here we go. I love where your head's at. He was the problem. The championship, championship block for us. Now that he's gone, here they come. The championships are just going to roll in, baby. That's it. Let's let's talk about that massive news. Saban retiring, the board getting hired. But first, Love's Travel Stops is now offering a nationwide 10 cent per gallon discount on gas and auto diesel. Just download the Love's Connect app and scan your barcode to the prompt on screen and watch that price drop 10 cents per gallon. Across the country, the Love's Connect app unlocks exclusive deals can help any traveler plan their ra- route or meal on the highway. So before you hit the road, be sure to download the Loves Connect app to save 10 cents per gallon and experience the country's best highway hospitality at Loves Travel Stops. I I did it twice on my way to Kansas City. (laughs) And you know what else I got, Ted? Oh, I know. Yeah, some fresh, delicious Java Amore. It was good, and too. Celebrate with Schooner All-American Ale, the official craft beer of OU Athletics from Coop Ale Works. Named after the iconic Sooner Schooner that races across Owen Field after an OU score, you can join in on the celebration with an ice cold beer from Coop Ale Works. You can enjoy it at the Palace on the Prairie, at OU Athletic Events, at the bar, at the tailgate, and in the comfort of your own home. For more information on Schooner All American Ale, visit schoonerale.com. Must be 21 to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Schooner All American Ale, the taste of game day. And Simple Modern is an Oklahoma drinkware company founded by OU grads. They have fantastic products, and that's why they found tremendous success selling the products at Target, Walmart, Amazon, and SimpleModern.com. I use Simple Modern cups. My wife uses Simple Modern cups. My kids use Simple Modern cups. Their products are for the whole family. Also, if you're a small business owner looking for some marketing swag for current and future customers, they make excellent customized products. Like this one. Ooh, look at that. Have a you, little Oklahoma breakdown. I, I got a question for you, Ted. Have you ever been uh-huh. attracted to a cup? <laughs> this is a good looking cup. Uh, yeah, I have. Look, I'm attracted to that look, one. I I got I got two of them at the house for you. I got to get them to you. That's awesome. But these are awesome. Thanks, Simple Modern, and you guys go check them out at simplemodern.com. Nick Saban retired. Yeah. The best coach, certainly of our lifetime. Uh, I I think he's the best college football coach ever. What was your initial reaction, Ted? Well, 
I guess I wasn't shocked. I was kind of surprised with how quick it all kind of uh, unfolded. Um, you know, he he's done enough that obviously he's earned the right to retire whenever he wants and do so with dignity. And uh, no matter what the outcome of the season was, this was an interesting season for him. As you heard, it took a lot out of him. Um, from where they started to where they finished, pretty daggum impressive. Um, you know, he's, you know, it's interesting. I typically, whenever you talk about a coach that has won at a level like Saban, you, you typically think that they did something on the field that revolutionized the game. And it's hard to think about that really with Saban. He was just. I think he revolutionized how college football programs are put together, which is really totally different from really any other coach. It's usually about the X's and O's. And for him, it's more about the organization that he built at Alabama. And uh, not to say that he's not great X's and O's. Obviously he is, but the machine that he built really kind of tells you everything about Saban as a coach. Um, he didn't want to just beat you on the field. He wanted to beat you in strength and conditioning, in the training room, in the lunch room, like how you meet, when you meet, like how, how the buildings are built, like everything, every single detail that they can beat you on is how he wanted to get his edge. I, I, I completely agree. Now you look at the resume and there's no need to go through all the accomplishments, but from the titles, the conference titles, to the award winners, to the draft picks, it's just insane. Man, it's insane. But the other massive effect he had was on the state of Alabama, that university in the city of Tuscaloosa. I oh, yeah. don't even know how you measure the economic impact he had on that community. It He was drastically underpaid, but... You mentioned it. I think when you talk about his legacy, people are always going to mention the titles. But I think his true legacy is the fact that he shaped the standard in the expectations when it comes to how a college football program operates. And that starts with X's and O's, right? He was the 3-4 defense guy mm -hmm. in college football for a while. And, and, you know, th some of the coverage stuff, you know, zone, zone match coverages, like he, he's credited with some of that stuff. He, he's clearly a gifted X's and O's guys, but operations and facilities, a scouting and recruiting, he, and that philosophy only taking certain players with certain physical profiles for certain positions that has spread throughout college football. You mentioned it, the nutrition, sports science, uh, strength and conditioning and recovery stuff. It felt like Bama was on the cutting edge of investing in that stuff. And he also just changed how you assemble a staff. Yeah, You think about all the analysts, all the people in the room, searching for each and every little advantage you could find. I think that's the biggest piece of his legacy is no one pushed everyone else around the country more than him to improve because yeah. he was having a crazy amount of success. And if Bama was doing it, well, damn it, we better do it or else we're not going to be on the same level as them. And I just, I think that that was his biggest impact was the amount of excellence that he had and that pushed others to try to be better, like, or else they were just going to continue to fall behind. So I think that's truly the titles are obviously ridiculous, but the way that he pushed everyone else is maybe his biggest imprint on the sport, in my opinion. And he did it 
you know, every every place has their issues, but he coached there a long time and without a whole lot of major drama. You know, I it was it was very well run. It wasn't just you know, it 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 was there's some there's been some places throughout college football history where hey, you want to win a title in order to win that title? We're gonna to have to deal with some stuff. All right, We're gonna, it's you can just we can we can say it. Urban Meyer, he didn't have any Urban well, Meyer problems. Yeah. You can just say it. Yeah, it, and I think that says a lot. And you know, I think because of how stone cold of a competitor Saban is, I think people d- didn't really believe or trust in the fact that whenever he said he cares about these guys and making their lives better and, and, you know, adding value to their futures. I think a lot of people took that as, you know, just talk and it's all about football. But whenever you look at the track record with, with guys graduating and, and not having a bunch of major drama, I believe it. So I think he's obviously the best ever. The way that his former players talk about him too. Yep. Uh, you don't really hear anything negative about him, which when you're dealing with the amount of talent that he dealt with, that's pretty impressive as well. He convinced all of these guys that would have started all across the country to come to Bama and compete. And I always, I had an and immense amount of respect. To compete. Wait to compete. Yeah. A year or two years before you got on the field. and. Um, that to me is, that's going to be the biggest hurdle that they face moving forward is the, you know, the pipeline to the NFL and there is a premium in the NFL on Nick Saban coached football players. There just is right. And is that still going to be there? And are guys going to be willing to wait their turn because of that? We'll see. I really hope, and I I don't think Nick Saban is just going to disappear from our lives. Uh, It sounds like he wants to have some type of role when it comes to shaping what this thing is going to look like. Getting it a little more organized. He was pretty good at organizing a program. Let's have him, maybe he'll take a crack at getting this thing back on the rails a little bit. Well, I'll tell you, it's the, the timing is interesting because over the last month, a bunch of College coaches, you've heard them talking about how we need a a commissioner. College football needs a commissioner. And Saban retires. And one of the things that he talks about is exactly, you know, trying to to get some guardrails and some some things in place to to keep this sport from falling apart. Something to think about. Interesting timing. And if they came out and said, Nick Saban is the new college football commissioner. I think everyone associated with college football would go. Sounds good. What are you going to (laughs) say? Exactly. (laughs) He doesn't know what he's doing. All right. Well, I know what they say. Well, he's going to, he's going to make the rules benefit Bama, but you know, whatever. I would be all for it. Yeah. I hope he's on game day. I really enjoy him on TV. That's Uh, pretty good. That's good. Funnier than, Funnier than people think, or at least I find him funny. So we'll we'll see what his media future looks like. But he's done quite a bit of that stuff in the past with ESPN. I'd be surprised if he doesn't continue to have a role on there. Now, before we get to the Kalen DeBoer hire, how does Saban retiring affect OU? The vast majority of people that listen to this podcast are OU fans, and I think that's what they're most concerned about. Like, what? is the overall impact for Oklahoma. Because my initial reaction is there's no way you can't say Nick Saban retiring isn't a positive thing for OU. I agree. The only way it it wouldn't have been would be if you lost staff or something to, to that spot whenever they started hiring. Um, So, Hopefully that doesn't happen, but you know, Alabama doesn't get shuffled to the back of the deck. 
Okay, number one. They are still in a really good place. They made a really good hire, but there is a wait and see. And when there's a wait and see, it leaves you a little bit of a window into some of those recruits. Now, I'm not saying Alabama's going to fall outside of the top 10 in recruiting anytime soon, but I went through the like their composite r- recruiting classes. You have to go back to like 2017 to where they weren't first or second. And then they were like fifth. And then you go back before that. Like I went twice. It was like, and then they were first the year before that and first year before that. So I just kind of quit. Like that's the thing though. Like if you're one and two every year and then now you're third and then now you're fourth, that's a huge difference. Like, a lot of times they were the number one class and they signed like eight five stars and the number two class signed like three five stars. Like that's a dramatic difference. So I Oklahoma, everyone else has a chance to chip away a little bit at some of those recruiting classes. And, you know, if you can win a game or two, Take start taking a game from them in Tuscaloosa a little bit more regularly than they did under uh, Nick Saban. Then it it doesn't fall apart, but they become human, and college football kind of absorbs that a little bit and spreads it around. I think Oklahoma can be one of the main beneficiaries. I'm with you, and that's the interesting part of this. And here in a little bit, I'm going to compliment Kalen DeBoer a lot. I think he's a heck of a football coach, but if you're Venables, if you're whoever going in a head to head recruiting battle with this new Bama staff, the reality is Kalen DeBoer has not sent a single Alabama player to the NFL. All those players, everyone that's in the wall on those walls and those facilities, all those first rounders, Nick Saban did that, not Kalen DeBoer. And that's just, that's something when it comes up, you might want to point that out. And when you compare, but let's compare what Venables has done. Even as when you just look at a defense coordinator, Venables has produced more high draft picks than DeBoer. So all of a sudden you're going head to head with a guy. You got a much better fighting chance with the other guys, not Nick Saban who can walk into any room and everyone just goes, damn it, Nick's here. That's recruiting against him was, I mean, what do you say? With Kalen DeBoer, he's not known as a dynamic, dynamite recruiter. Now, everything I've been told about the guy is that he is a really good relationship builder, clearly a heck of a football coach, but he's never gone down into the Southeast and won recruiting battles against Kirby Smart. So it it does feel like a door in the recruiting world with Saban leaving that the door cracks open a little bit for everyone else, including Oklahoma. That's how it feels to me. Maybe Maybe DeBoer gets there and all of a sudden it's number one recruiting class after number one recruiting class after number one recruiting class. But he has not shown the ability to do that. So we'll see. All I know is that all these coaches across the SEC say, yeah, I'd rather recruit against Kalen DeBoer than Nick Saban. That's just, that's obvious. Yeah. And, you know, the... To me, the most, the thing that sticks out about it the most is, you know, and I'm not saying it's, it's not a, a good hire. I think it is a good hire, but you know, it's interesting to swing the mentality of that entire program from defense to offense. Yeah. And I, I've talked about this a lot, and I'm not saying that you can't win as an offensive coach. Clearly, it's been done over and over and over at every level. But programs are entirely different. 
run under an offensive coach than a defensive coach because the two sides of the ball, they have to operate like with a different mindset and like the, like the, the details and like, I I don't know. That's to me, that can be something that's going to be interesting. And he has to find a way he can't just go in there and continue to try and be Nick Saban. He has to make it his program. How he does that, I don't know. It's going to be difficult to convince people to change some things that don't necessarily need changing, but you still have to do it. Like it can't, you can't, you can't really, you won't get the respect that you ever need to run the place if you just slide in and do what has always been done. At least that's the challenge that he has is trying to figure that out. Do you think it is helpful that Saban's still going to have an office there at the stadium? We've seen think, that stuff before, right? Bill Snyder, I think Bill Snyder still has an office at Kansas State. So this isn't something that's, you now this is the first time this has happened. On one hand, DeBoer can go to him at any time and say, hey, what do you think about this? What did you do in this situation? But also, you just have this, this massive, this idol sitting there just watching, overseeing everything. It's not a problem until it's a problem. Right. You know? That's a good and point. I think that Saban being there is is a is however much he is going to be there. It's great to to be able to lean on him and say like, who are the first ten donors I need to to meet? I what's the like? Give me the lay of the land and recruiting and so like. However, that conversation needs to go. Where it's not going to be good is if you stumble early and Saban's still standing around and everyone's talking about Saban being there. You know what I'm saying? Like, Well, when you look at the timing of it, the SEC, with the addition of OU in Texas, the division's going away. The SEC, good, in my uh, opinion, it's about to be as difficult as it's been. Alabama's schedule next year is brutal. Yeah, and you you factor in NIL, and I don't know if it's created parity per se, but it does feel like some of the top talent has spread out more. And now that Nick Saban's not at Bama, my expectation is they won't get as many of the most talented guys because Nick Saban's no longer there. Now, Bama's still going to be a huge deal. We'll see what their NIL operation is like. But I don't know, man. It It's going to be – it's impossible for him to have anything close to the amount of success that Saban had. I just – I don't think we're ever going to see that again in college football. Here's the truth of the matter. Nick Saban is a hell of a coach. He's not – he's not dumb. and. I buy that he was worn out and it took a lot out of him this year. I buy that hundred percent, but I also am not naive to the fact that Saban could have stepped down anytime he wanted to, and he picked now. Why did he pick now? He picked now because it's getting more and more difficult to hang on to the top, to hang on to your players to win recruits because of NIL and I, the new breakdown of the SEC, the new schedule. You've heard me bitch on this show forever about the way that the SEC has always scheduled. They've made, they've given their best teams an easier run at it. It's just, that's how it is. That's not going to be the case anymore. It's, it's all, you know, streamlined. It's you know what you're going to get in the future. So it's going to be way more difficult. Now, I don't know what the 12 team playoff holds, but I mean, I I'm not naive to think that Saban stepped down right now, just because if he's tired and thought it was time, there's definitely a, 
it's going to get way harder for Alabama in the future. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to see how Kalen DeBoer does. Now, everyone I've talked to really likes this guy. Uh, guys that I talk to guys that have coached for him or with him. I've talked to broadcasters that cover multiple of his games. Everyone says that he's just all about ball. Does a great job of building a tight knit group relates to the players. Well, sounds like a guy that should have a ton of success with a really, really talented roster, but there does seem to be, and I don't think concerns the right word, but just, you know, just the question, how's he going to do down in that area of the country? Because he's not from the South, nor has he ever coached or really recruited in that area. And I keep seeing people reference Brian Harson and how poorly that went at Auburn. I don't think that's fair at all to DeBoer. I, I, I think that was just a weird circumstance, weird, weird situation. It clearly failed miserably for Harson, but there, there are questions. Hey, can he win those big time sec, a lot of money being thrown at all these guys, these recruiting battles. So I, I think he deserves the benefit of the doubt until we're able to see how it plays out these first couple of years, but I, I don't really know what to expect, man. We've seen how many great football coaches have we seen go somewhere and it just, for whatever reason, didn't work where it felt like it was a home run hire and as good of a fit as this feels like it, it is. I just, I don't know, especially when you compare it to what Saban did there. So I, it feels like a great hire because the guy has won everywhere he's been. But also, let's remember this. Kalen DeBoer, who once again, I think is a great coach. I loved watching that offense that him and Grubb put together at Washington. But Nick Saban has won seven national titles as a head coach, six of them at Bama. Kalen DeBoer has been a D1 head coach for four years. He's been a power five head coach for two years. Saban's almost got double the national titles that DeBoer's got years coached in the power five. I, I don't know what to expect. I think he's a great coach, but is it going to work the way that a lot of people think it is? I, I don't know. Well, well, the first thing we have to do is define success. What does success look like for DeBoer over the next three years at Alabama? He has to win a title. He has to win a title. That's exactly that's, right. That's Bama. That's it. I, this isn't, hey, compete. I, I don't think this is going to work because it really can't work. He's not going to replicate what Saban did. So I I think he's a good coach. I think he's going to do some good things there. But the situation it's not it's not winnable. Like you you're just you're not going to live up to that that expectation. I don't think he'll win a title there. Could be totally wrong on this. But he's never you mentioned his coaching. He's never He's never coached at a place like Alabama. Like Washington's a good school. They've done some good things over the years. It is not live and die football at Washington. It's not. Have some success. I will get behind you whenever you do. But you know, you're it's okay if you have a down year and you're rebuilding. You you, there is none of that. The pressure and the the eyeballs and everyone peering in on what you're doing there and second guessing every single you will have no 
there, there's not going to be any benefit of the doubt. There's not going to be any margin for error on anything. Every little thing that happens is going to be scrutinized to pieces by your fan base, by the SEC, like media monster that just chews up people and spits them out. And I just I think that's going to happen to him. I mean, but that's not that I think it's going to happen to Kevin DeVoe. I think it would have happened to anyone. And then you reset a little bit and your your expectations kind of like rationalize a little bit and then you hire someone else and then off off you go. I just it's an it's an unwinnable situation in my opinion. I and it has nothing to do with him. If that makes sense. <laughs> I I think We'll see. That's where I'm at with it. Yeah. I'm just thinking about what I said. Did I say? I think I may have messed up double. I don't know. I don't remember what I said. All I know is Nick Saban's got a lot of national titles and Caleb DeBoer only had two years at Washington. Yeah. That'd be four times, almost four times. I don't know. I don't remember what I said. I'm kind of an idiot, though, so who knows? But I... You you never know how a guy and everything. Once again, everyone I talked to said that he's very calm in big moments, and they attribute attribute his calm demeanor in those moments as to why Washington's won so many one scored games. Uh, that his his team reflected his attitude in those moments. I was told that by multiple people, but I I don't think you know how a guy's going to react. To being in that fishbowl, being the head guy at Bama after Saban, I don't know how you you expect a guy to react. I don't, and I don't think you know until he's in it, and we'll see. Well, part of the reason you stay calm is because I, and I mean, no one's going to put a for sale sign in your yard. No one cares. I not like they are about to. All right. If you if you would have lost one of those games, Dag Gummit, the championship run, the undefeated run is over, but you keep pushing forward. That ain't what it's gonna be like in Alabama. All right. It's it's gonna be a different beast. I wish him luck. It's gonna be fun to watch it from the outside. No doubt about it. And Kalen DeBoer coming to Norman next year, not Nick Saban. I for one. If you would have given me those options, I would have said, yes, I will take DeBoer instead of Saban. Thank you. But Jed Fish to Washington, brutal loss for Arizona. Yeah, We talked a lot about him heading into the Alamo Bowl uh, with that matchup that OU had with Arizona for that one. And I, I love that hire for Washington. He was on the Seahawks staff. A while back, I really liked Jed Fish, and just a that's a brutal loss for those uh, for the for that Arizona, uh, just that community because it it really felt like he was ha he had that thing rolling, but I think Washington gave him nearly eight million dollars a year. Yeah, so it's gonna be hard to compete for Arizona. I just I loved the quote that I saw, and I don't know how much truth it is. And I don't even remember whose, whose timeline it was on, but uh, it was, it wasn't a priority for Arizona to, to keep Jed fish, which, you know, I guess that's basically saying it was out of their price range to keep Jed fish. Understandable. We knew that was going to happen. That's, you know, kind of what I talked about. He's, he's good, but the problem is he's too good. You got to live in that, like, the eight and four range to be able to hang on to your coach at Arizona. Anything better than that, he's going to get poached. If I was Jed Fish, I would. I'd try to take several of those Arizona guys. I know that. Yeah. Arizona, the, the fans already hate you. Might as well take the best players as well, especially McMillan. Yeah. Yeah. Start. And Fafita. Uh, McMillan and Fafita, that's. That's a really good start at it right there. And uh, five on defense if he's still still got uh, eligibility left.
it felt like their entire team had eligibility left. That was a young football team. Yeah. Which, and this, not to stick on this whole thing too long, but Kalen DeBoer won at Washington with a lot of old guys. I mean, you saw it. They're in the national title game. What do they have? Seven or eight, 60 year guys. Jed Fish was winning with a bunch of guys that he recruited and th- that him and his staff developed. Bunch of sophomores. And did Washington maybe upgrade at head coach? Just saying. Uh, he'll have he'll have more success at Washington than DeBoer does at Alabama. Well, number one, because success is different. Relative. It's it's different at those two places. But the first thing for DeBoer is he ain't gonna have Penix right away. All right. He like that's Penix was special. He's gonna have to have someone that can replicate that. You know. It all sounds like your offense is just the greatest thing ever. Whenever you've got a guy that can do everything that you ask of him, things can change pretty quickly whenever that dude's not back there. Yeah. It's going to be really interesting, man. It is. Did we just really compliment DeBoer a lot, but also just completely crush him? I feel like that's what just happened. Well, I don't mean to crush him. I just don't. I That's what I think of the situation. I think it's unwinnable, and it would have been for anyone. The new structure of the SEC combined with the expanded playoff, those two things, it just feels impossible for Kalen DeBoer to accomplish anything that feels even close to what Nick Saban did. Yeah. And I'm not sure it has anything to do with DeBoer. It just, this new structure should be hard, man. And at the, the first sign of one tiny little crack, it's not going to be like it was with Saban. Well, Saban's going to figure that out. I feel sorry for those guys this weekend or whatever, you know. It's it's going to be a totally different reaction. Any tiny little crack, people are going to start chiseling it and seeing, you know. So, I it's tough. It's tough. We'll see. All right, let's finish up with our winners and losers of the weekend. But first, all right, all you grill masters, listen up. Didier Ranch delivers premium quality beef that is 100% raised in Oklahoma right to your front door. Go to DidierRanch.com, D-I-D-I-E-R Ranch.com to order one of their premium quality beef boxes, filet, ribeye, New York strip, sirloin, steak burgers. They've got it all, and they ship anywhere in the continental U.S., and Oklahomans get their deliveries in just one to two days. The only thing better than having a lot of premium beef on the O and D line is having premium beef delivered right to your front door. Didier Ranch, tradition tastes better. And John Vance Auto Group has a deal for Oklahoma Breakdown listeners. Go to any of their nine full-service dealerships in Woodward, Miami, and Guthrie. Tell them we sent you, and they'll give you $500 off. That is $500 off just because you listen to this silly podcast. They've been serving Oklahomans for 40 years. They're family-owned and operated, and no matter what your vehicle needs are, John Vance Auto Group has you covered. They carry domestic brands such as Ford, Lincoln, Chevy, Buick, GMC, Chrysler, Dodge, Ram, Jeep, and Wagoneer. John Vance Auto Group's goal is to give unequaled service and to exceed customers' expectations in every way. You can find all the information about their lifetime loyalty program, browse their entire inventory, and find the John Vance dealership near you at vanceautogroup.com. And head to the garage for hand smashed patties, butter toasted buns, and ice cold beer. It's the perfect spot to watch any big game. With all the garage locations being open at 10 p.m. or later every night, it's the go to late night spot. Visit eatatthegarage.com to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. Just decided I'm getting the garage for dinner. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. Nice. Sounds good. All right. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the weekend? Green Bay Packers, Green Bay Packers, no big deal. Just kind of find their way into the playoffs, had what felt like maybe the quietest season ever. And they dispatched the Dallas Cowboys in the, in the first round and hang 48 points on them. Go right down the field score. um, When the game started, then they tack on a pick six. And it was just kind of off to the races from that point on. The final score was 48-32. 
that final score is not indicative of what we watched. It was like, was it 48 16 at one point? Yeah. 42 16. Yeah. 48 16. Uh, Packers scored with 10 23 to go in the fourth. Uh, Dallas got two garbage time touchdowns and one team had a quarterback that looked extremely confident, that looked almost shockingly calm, got his offense into all the right plays, was changing protections, making sure he was protecting himself, was delivering accurate footballs, pushing it down the field. And that guy played for the Green Bay Packers. Jordan Love was awesome in this game, dude. Awesome. And on the other side, Dak, with another very disappointing playoff performance that, let's be real, man, he is going to get hammered for. Yeah. This is what's crazy to me. If Jordan Love, and it looks like he's going to slide right in and and everything's going to work out. It, let's say he plays 10 years there. The Green Bay Packers will have had three quarterbacks over 40 years. Is that the most insane thing ever in sports? Yes. <laughs> How crazy is that, I mean, man? Just- just think about what has happened at the quarterback position for New England since Tom Brady left. Perfect example. They've, the Packers have, and I'm not comparing, I'm not even comparing Brett Favre to Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers. But they have, it looks like Jordan Love is going to be at the very least what a Pro Bowl caliber quarterback. He's off to a really good start. He, I mean, it, it's, he looked. It, it, yeah. I couldn't have been more impressed with him in that game. He was in, dude. He was in complete control of that offense. Yeah, I was. Li- I listened to some of it uh, as I ran to town, and like, I don't know, like on a third and long, just moving around in the pocket, move outside, move back into the pocket, and deliver a you know, like a 25, 30 yard strike down the middle of the field to pick up a first down and keep a drive moving. And yeah, it's just, it looks smooth and efficient and you just let things come to you. And it was like with Dak, like, this is the moment been great all year, but this is the, this is the part where, you know, the Cowboys traditionally choke and it felt like, Prescott was worried about that before he even stepped on the field today. That game, when it was 14 to nothing, just like that, right? The interception, and I I don't know how much you can blame Dak for the early interception. Uh, Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, he's throwing it right where it needs to be. And I think that was Jair Alexander. Just a, it's a really good play. Mm -hmm. Refs letting him play, really good play. But, it was 14 to nothing in the blink of the eye. And I turned to my wife. I said, I think the Cowboys are about to get blown out. Mm-hmm. It just, it, cause it was a nightmare start. And for everyone that's been around fans included, that doubt crept in quickly. Like, oh my gosh, here we go again. And I, I don't know what happens to Mike McCarthy after that. But they straight up laid an egg. Belichick? I don't, I, I don't know. Brable? I Arbaugh? don't know. Harbaugh? Gruden? <laughs> I don't know what they're going to do, man. Uh, it's, uh, it's That Dallas defense got diced up. I know it. I Run know game, it. screen Run game. game was crazy. Vertical passing game, receivers, tight ends. Aaron Jones is a stud. That yeah. guy's so good. But it's just I still crazy, can't believe man. how calm Jordan Love looked. He looked like the guy that had played in a bunch of playoff games, not Dak Prescott. Yeah. It's wild. I, I still I, – I cannot get over 
how successful Green Bay has been able to to be at getting their next franchise quarterback. It's it's crazy. And to think like it could get difficult for that franchise if if they ever had like a couple of misses back to back. You know, I mean, they've got a built-in great fan base. There's no doubt about that. But, I mean, not easiest place in the world to recruit free agents to go play. You know, I mean, it's there's they've got some built-in, um, you know, speed bumps, I guess you would say. But <laughs> hit it out of the park. It's crazy. Dallas, mm, another disappointing end. There, there are going to be a lot of calls for change yeah, in that organization. And I just, I don't know what's going to happen. They, they had There'll moments this season where they looked fantastic. There'll be change. I mean, I, everyone thought there was going to be change last year. All right. And I, I just can't imagine with the way that place operates that they don't have some, some big things happen there. Well, how about, there's a lot of coach openings, right? There's a lot of vacancies. Dan Quinn's name has been connected to several of them, especially Seattle. And that defense, the defense that he's in charge of just went out there and did that. Mm. Brutal. Not great. Who do you have as your loser of the weekend? Oh, you men's hoops. Hmm. Mm. Tried to go up and get the uh, reverse the curse, get the win in the fog, and uh, started off solid. They were right there toe to toe, played with them for you know pretty much the first half, and then just couldn't answer the bell whenever they came out for the second half. Kansas extended really quickly, got up on them, and then at that point it was just too much. It was. It was a tough watch in the second half, especially the last 12 minutes or so. Right. It looked like their the, – the first half was great. Wildly entertaining, back and forth. A shot making, yeah. I, I thought both teams were playing at a high level. And then in the second half, Kansas kind of took it to another level and OU wasn't able to match it. Yeah. They weren't really able to get close. Mm -mm. So, yeah, once – we weren't able to to continue to hit all the shots from the outside. We just couldn't couldn't keep pace with what Kansas was doing on the interior. Too many easy buckets. So that's a tough place to win. And I especially whenever like when they extend a lead on you and go on a run and as loud as that place gets, it just feels so overwhelming to be able to claw your way out of it. And it's just a talented, really well coached basketball team. Bill Self's pretty good at the whole coaching thing. Pretty good. Hunter Dickinson, he he did not play very well, in my opinion, in their loss to UCF. I thought he bounced back nicely, and centers didn't really have an answer for him. Mm -hmm. McCuller, and he didn't shoot it particularly well, especially from three against So yeah, I think he was one for five or so. But his improvement as a shooter this season, I think he's one of the most improved players on the offensive end in all of college basketball. Uh, defense yeah. was always his thing. He's long, really long guard, but his shooting is, has gone to another level. And yeah, man, I really hope, I was really hoping that it would be at least a game that came down to the last few possessions where we could complain about the refs, but it, I know we couldn't even yeah. do that because the back half of the second half, the two teams felt, Let's be real. It felt like there was there was a gap. Yep, that's right. It did, and you know, I it honestly it doesn't mean a whole lot about Oklahoma. You don't have to feel like all of a sudden they're they're not what you hoped they were going to be. That's how this conference goes, man. It's going to be really difficult to win any game on the road, let alone going in and beating Kansas on the road. So. Uh, still a good team. I'm still hopeful for what they can accomplish this year. They just got to continue to get better, uh, take better care of the the basketball, and um, you know, we'll see. They'll be fine.
off to a one and two start in Big 12 play, but so is Texas. So is Houston. This league, it's going to be a bloodbath, man. It is going to be an absolute bloodbath. I was looking at the standings, and there's like four teams in the top top ten in the country that aren't even in the top four in the conference right now. (laughs) It's it's going to be a fun year, and I think uh, I think that this OU team is much better. They're way more fun to watch for me. It's just way more entertaining style of basketball for me, especially on the offensive end. But yeah, you. I know this. You got to protect home court. I have to. You got to steal some on the road, but they have to protect home court. So, oh, you fans, keep showing up to the Lloyd Noble Center. I had I I do radio uh, during basketball t- season sometimes with King McClure, and he was on the call for the Iowa State game. And he texted me and said, hey, it's, this, is, this is by far the best I've ever seen it since he's been doing it. Yeah. So they, people are starting to notice. So you fans keep showing up. That team's going to need you because they need to protect home court. Can't be losing your home games, Ted. Nope. Nope. Got to hold serve in this conference. Absolutely. 100%. Let's finish up with my winner and loser. But first... Elevate your tailgate with Chapel Supply and Equipment, Oklahoma City. Chapel Supply and Equipment has generators and inverters on hand that will give you all the power you need so you could take your tailgate to the next level. They've also got top-of-the-line heaters to keep you warm during those cold tailgates later in the season. Oklahoma owned and operated. Elevate your tailgate by calling 405-495-1722 or visit chapelsupply.com. That's C-H-A-P-P-E-L-L supply.com. And attention, business owners, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective, comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. If your business wants to be best in class, Connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. And head to OpolisClothing.com for our podcast merchandise and the best OU gear out there. That's O-P-O-L-I-S Clothing.com. Use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off. That's OpolisClothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. For my winner of the weekend... The Kansas City Chiefs. Ooh. I was I was at the Chiefs Dolphins game. I will I witnessed history. I was part of history. It was the coldest game ever at Arrowhead. They set it over the PA system. And I think they said it was the fourth coldest recorded temperature in NFL history. It was really cold. But I wasn't cold because I was prepared, baby. And I well, I had people say, No, you were sitting in a suite. No, I wasn't. I didn't I, I was not in a suite. I did have club level tickets and I could go inside if I wanted to, but I didn't. I stayed out in the elements and I watched a football game. And I was seriously underwhelmed by Tua. Whoa. But yeah, let's talk about the weather a little bit. I had a heated vest. Heated socks, heated gloves, fleece-lined boots around the heated socks, brought cardboard to stand on. I was a dang Boy Scout, man. My wife and I, we were prepared. We brought our two-and-a-half-year-old. He was loving it. I mean, he was head-to-toe covered, just warm as could be. Get one feeling anything. I was nearly sweating. Our seats (laughs) somehow were kind of blocked from the wind, so... It, it was great, and there are so many funny things about it. I, I've never seen more ski goggles at a football game in my life. It was almost distracting in the crowd. Like, if you looked at the crowd, you just saw, like, these flashes of everyone's ski goggles, like the reflective ones. It was That's funny. It was pretty cool. There, there's no doubt in my mind that is the most ski goggles worn at an NFL game. There, there's just no doubt. But there's this beer vendor that kept coming by us, and he was yelling, Hot beer, 
<laughs> hot beer. It'll keep you warm. It was, it had no ice on it. It was, I, I never seen that in my entire life, but I did have a proud dad moment. Okay. My son was bundled up. He had like a full on body suit on that we got him last year. And I asked him several times in the first half, buddy, I know it's really cold. Do you want to go inside? And my wife would ask him. And eventually he just turns to me and goes, Dada, I want to watch the game. <laughs> well, all right then, son. But we went into the club level. We got some food, some drinks at halftime. Nice and warm in there, Ted. Real nice. Yeah. It wasn't minus 20 whatever wind chill like it was out in the elements. But we got him out of the suit, let him run around a little bit. And in my head, I was thinking, I'm going to watch this second half out there by myself. My wife's not coming back out there. My son's certainly not coming back out there. Well, I'm sitting in the seat. Maybe two minutes go by in the third quarter. And here comes my son just walking down the stairs. And I was shocked. I was, wow, buddy, what's up? And my wife's right behind him. And she goes, he said he wanted to come back outside. Just a football guy, baby. Let's go. I love it. I love it. Yeah, all I could think of is uh, Dumb and Dumber whenever, you know, he's got the uh, – <laughs> where are these gloves? My hands are starting to sweat. Yeah, Everyone are... else is out there freezing, and you're electrified. You had, you had an extra pair of gloves this entire time. <laughs> I, I, It was cold, dude. It was really cold, but I, it was funny. I was getting drinks with, with the old bell dozer after the game, and he said he was trying to do smelling salts on the sideline. And that his nose just didn't, didn't work. work. Like, just couldn't smell a thing. And you know how strong those things are. So it looked like a miserable experience to play in that football game. But as far as the game, that's a performance to forget for the Dolphins. You knew it was going to happen. I mean, everyone I, said they were going to play awful in that weather. And well, yeah, it was nailed bad. It. They couldn't even complete, you know, when two, they're just trying to throw like, a bubble or whatever you want to call it to the outside to let someone go to work with the ball in their hands. And they couldn't even complete those. It was terrible. Terrible. The, the, the run game didn't help them at all. They couldn't get it going. Kansas city's defense really controlled things at the line of scrimmage, but, and especially watching after watching Jordan love for the Packers to it just seem he, he was not seeing it, man. He seemed late all game long. It did not look like he was seeing things well uh, multiple times where it looked like he was surprised by pressures that I could see. And now I'm sitting up there at the top. You got a much better view up there, but with how prepared I know NFL quarterbacks are for games, I know he saw some of these pressures coming. And I have to assume he knows where his protection is working. And he just, it looked, he looked surprised by some of these things. Well, what about the the fourth and two down near the goal line where they're in a like a two man front Kansas City on defense and he doesn't do anything, doesn't recognize it at all? That's crazy. I, I he so left a lot to be worried about the cold, right? You're you're you can't think about anything else. How do I get the hell off this football field is all you can think about. I was very underwhelmed with him. Even the touchdown to Tyreek Hill. I'll say it, it was a horrible ball. It was horrible. Yep. It was the two of haters, the detractors of his. They watched that and went, told y'all. Well, and that's the problem. Because unless you get home field in the AFC, Buffalo, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, Kansas City. It ain't the, you're going outside, and in January, buddy, I'm not saying it's going to be zero, but it ain't going to be sunny and fast. I, I wish it was zero. It would have been nice. Zero, it, zero would have felt like summer compared to that. But I, I was, on the other side of things, I was shocked that the Dolphins played as much zero, speaking of zero, as they did. And I don't know why you would try to play Mahomes that way. Guy just makes the right play with the football. Mm -hmm. Beat it. 
he he beat the pressure damn near every time with the ball. Rasheed Rice was running away from guys on those crossers. Kelsey got to go to work a little bit, had some nice plays. Mahomes is just, he's just so good. I would, as you watched Tua struggle the way he did, and then you watched Mahomes handle their pressure plan the way that he did, did some damage with his legs in key spots, especially most notably that fourth down. It was just, it was night and day watching those two dudes operate at the quarterback position. Well, I mean, it's, it's the first time Tua's thrown a ball in any, like they didn't have any time to gear up for that at all. And I know it wasn't that cold all week, but you know, Mahomes still has the ability to practice outside in the elements to, to know what it's like to throw a ball in freezing cold temperatures and like they got off the bus and we were like, what the hell's going on here? Like this, you can't play football in this. And then you got to go out there and try and adapt on the fly. You just can't do that in the NFL playoffs. Miami had three starting offensive linemen come out in sleeves. And I went, Hmm. I've never seen that. So it went about it the way that I thought it would. And the old belldozer got to play a lot. Ted, how do you like going in motion full speed and then going and hitting Melvin Ingram? That's fun. Did it about 10 well, times. <laughs> I, I'd rather do it if it's a big part of the game plan and I'm playing a lot other than I've been standing there for three hours and all of a sudden we're going to start running the football at the end of the game and you're frozen trying to jog on the field well, and get going. Luckily, Blake, he, he played a lot of snaps. That's the most snaps he's played in a, a, in a while. So I was, I was fired up for him. But I think the game within the game, what I was focused on, you know, be trade against Christian Wilkins. Oh, basically like drugs for me. Trade is so good, dude. Sleeves on? Nope. <laughs> no gloves either. Psycho. That's I, a problem. That's whew. now he had a little he he had the hand warmer and he put him in there in, in between plays. He's not a complete idiot. If he didn't do that, honestly, he wouldn't have been able to feel his hands. It was it was that cold. I so, saw they were just to cut in on that real quick. They were showing like the highlights from the old ice bowl and stuff, uh, with the Packers and like none of hardly, I don't think any of the players that I saw in those videos had gloves on. None of them. <laughs> Insane people. Uh, but last there thing, last two things. No shirts on. I know that. Yeah, I didn't see any shirtless people this time. If you were, if you were shirtless, like you were in danger. Straight up. I think up. it was a guy that is like had to go to the hospital hospital for hypothermia. I think. Well, he was probably doing something stupid. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I thought, I thought Creed handled Christian Wilkins, who a lot of people consider other than Aaron Donald, the best defense tackle in football. Creed's going to get a hundred million dollars. That's my, his next contract's going to be a hundred million dollars. Mm. Just, and then the last thing on that game, Mahomes' helmet breaking was crazy. Never yeah, seen, never seen that. Never seen that. Mm-mm. I guess they don't test that helmet in those type of temperatures, which I don't really blame them because it was ridiculous. Yeah, that was pretty wild. That's it should have been a call, uh, should have been a targeting call on Mahomes, but um, other than that, pretty crazy. Big old chunk snapped off of there. Uh, targeting on the quarterback, you'll have to miss the second half. <laughs> what? <laughs> Could you imagine that if that was a rule in the NFL? Mahomes has to miss the second half. See uh, the second half and the in the first half of next week's the, game. The first half, and the first <laughs> half of next week's game. Oh, it's funny when you frame it that way. All right, my loser of the weekend. Thought about going with the Cleveland Browns. Man, we talked about Dallas not playing well. Holy, C.J. Stroud is that dude. I told you, he's that dude. That was a oh, whooping. All right, that's the final like nail in the coffin on who won the trade, I guess, right? <laughs> you think? My gosh, the Texans look they look good, man. That was that was real that was really impressive for them to carve up that Cleveland defense the way that they did. Cleveland was favored in that game. Mm -hmm. And the Texans embarrassed him. And Joe Flacco looked old. 
which uh, I will say, like, D'Amico Ryans was probably who I would have hired at Alabama or would have tried to hire. Maybe they did, and there was no chance at it. You're not leaving the NFL when you got a quarterback like C.J. Stroud. No chance. Yeah. Yep. Got to be feeling uh, real good about things. But my loser of the weekend – Anyone in the Oklahoma City Thunder's way. Let's go, baby. Portland Trailblazers on Thursday night. Smacked. Orlando Magic on Saturday night. For the guys that weren't playing for the Magic, maybe it wasn't as dominant of a win as you would like if you're a Thunder fan. But, hey, you take it. Comfortable win. Team is rolling. And and we don't have to spend any time on the Trailblazers game. Uh, That team stinks. There's that was That was bad. Really, bad. but but the magic, you know, winning comfortably, even with all the guys that didn't play for the magic, winning comfortably on a night where you're, you go eight of 36 from three, you'll take it, man. You'll take that every day of the week. And SGA, he's ridiculous. Shade, Shade Gil just Alexander's ability to finish around the rim is insane. I think he had, and to finish through contact, I think he had like six and ones in that game. No one can stay in front of the guy. Uh, He is just, anyone that appears to guard him, he just goes by everybody. And he gets to the rim and into the paint at will. And he has developed an absolute arsenal of finishes. Just another 37. Crazy. Crazy. I, athletic, mid range, shoot the three, athletic, can run. Fun to watch, dude. Dude, I, I truly believe right now, if you had to poll everyone that has an MVP vote, I think he'd be your leader. Wow. He's just playing, he is playing really good basketball. You look at some of the other guys, I think Jalen Williams' confidence is continuing to grow. And like it backs him up that the record's there. It's not just a guy that's playing great on a bad team. You know, the record is right there. You're what they, they're got to be close to the, are they number one in the West record? Tied Tied. for the best record in the West with Minnesota at 27 and 11. There you go. And uh, I just think a couple of other guys. I've been really impressed with Giddy. Giddy's playing better. I, I know that he's dealt with a lot, but it seems like he's settled into his role. I, I think he's finally figured out that, hey, he's not the third guy anymore. He's more the fourth guy. And it just seems like he's playing with more confidence, passing the ball really well. He's going to have some bad shooting games, but he's also had some really solid shooting games. And, and it just feels like it's, fitting better together than it was a month ago. Uh, Jalen Williams is awesome. Yep. I mean, he was so, he's so good around the rim, but he's really developing a go-to in that pull-up jumper. Just seems like it's unguardable. And, and he's starting to hit that a good, at a good clip. My man meets it. Starting to look like the NBA slowing down for him a little bit. Now he's not going to blow you away with stat lines. But you love his passing. He's he's a physical guy. I, I don't know. I like what I've seen from him. And it's a fun week to be a Thunder fan. Lakers on Monday, Clippers on Tuesday, Utah on Thursday, and then Minnesota on Saturday. So it, it's a tough road trip. But, man, I'm all in on Thunder basketball, dude. It, it feels so good to be back. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, that's that's oh yeah, and be Chet a- Holmgren's he's he's really good at basketball. He's rookie of the year at this point. Stud. Stud. Feels watching Portland. Because remember, Portland's who beat him, and then like the whole thing blew up. Yep. Right? Everyone remembers Dame Lillard doing the little wave. Still a great gif, gif, however you say it. Still great. It's great. That was crazy though. But <laughs> nuts. Remember when Paul George said that was a bad shot? <laughs> that was funny. But you think about where the Thunder were then, and where this organization was two years ago when they got beat by 70, whatever. 
and then to then beat Portland the way that they did the other night, for that to flip like that in two years, it just – it's crazy, man. It's its a lot of fun is what it is. It's awesome. Yep. I love it. Got to keep it rolling. No doubt. Birthday shout-outs. Happy 12th birthday to Patrick Olney. Happy 42nd birthday to Chad Littlefield. On that note, episode 387 in the books. We'll have a new episode on Wednesday. I believe our guy Jeff Schwartz is going to join us to talk some college football and and talk a little NFL playoffs. So it should be a lot of fun stuff with our buddy G off. But until then, we appreciate y'all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.